Hi, Professor. This is uh, Zach Alexander from Data605. Um, and before I get started, I just want to say a quick thank you up front. Um, really enjoyed this course. Um, it was interesting to work through the final um, here to kind of summarize many of the things that, that I learned this semester. So um, really appreciate it. Um, for the sake of time, I'll, I'll dive right in here. Um, the first part of the final asks us to generate a random variable um, x with 10,000 random uniform numbers from 1 to n and generate a random variable y that has 10,000 random normal numbers with a mean and standard devi deviation of n plus 1 divided by 2 here. Um, and for this I chose an n of 10 and ran my syntax below to generate my variables x and y. Um, then, as the final asks, I calculated the probabilities A through C, but before doing so, I made sure to calculate the median of X um, and save it to a variable that was little x here. And I also um, calculated uh, the first quartile of Y and saved it in a variable called uh, lowercase y here as well. Save them in a data frame and also calculate the total rows of the data frame there. All right, so for part A, um, where we have to um, find the probability that um, x is greater than uh, the median of the distribution of x, given that x is greater than um, the uh, first quartile of the distribution of y. Um, I remember the, the equation that we had used here um, from class, and it basically states that the probability of A given B is equal to the probability of A and B divided by the probability of B. And uh, for the sake of our problem, we can substitute in um, you know, the probability of X is greater than the median of, of X uh, for A, and then uh, for B we can substitute in the probability that X is greater than the first quartile of Y. Um, and after solving this using R, I found that the probability um, turns out to be 0.55.09642 here. Um, and then for part B, uh, it asks um, for us uh, to find the probability that um, x is greater than the median of the distribution of x and that y is greater than the distribution of the first quartile of y. Um, and then again, I remember from class that we had the equation here to be able to um, figure that out, that it's basically just multiplying the probability of A times the probability of B. Um, and to substitute in for A, we know that um, A can be uh, basically just the probability of um, X being greater than the median of X. And right, A specifically is just the, the count of times that X is greater than the median of X. And then we obviously divide that by the, the total number of the distribution of X there. And then likewise for B, we can substitute in um, the number of times that Y is greater than the first quartile of the distribution of Y. Um, and then obviously divided by the total number of in the distribution of y would be the probability for b. And the calculation here um, in R shows that the probability is 0 0.3756. To summarize this the, is the probability that um, x is greater than the median of the distribution of x and y is greater than the first quartile of the distribution of y is 0 0.3756. Um, uh, for the uniform numbers um, that were generated from 1 to 10. Um, and that's part 2, part C, or part B, that part C here. Um, we can use the same equation as part A. Um, however, we're just going to substitute with different parameters here. Um, so I won't go into the same equation that I discussed in part A, but similar process here, and the output is 0 0.4490. Um, and to summarize, the probability that A is less than the median of the distribution of X, given that X is greater than the first quartile of the distribution of Y, is 0 0.4490. Now, the um, next part um, is to investigate whether the probability that x is greater than the median of x and y is greater than the first quartile y is equal to these multiplied together by evaluating the marginal um, and joint probabilities. And kind of to do this investigation, we can um, calculate the joint probabilities by multiplying the probability of A times the probability of B um, there. And uh, in order to, to do this, I um, 
basically started to think through the conditions for the joint probabilities and found that um, values of x and y would fall into the following two categories. Um, is x greater than or less than the median of x? And is y less than or greater than the first quartile of y? Um, and then when constructing these conditions, I then was able to apply these to my data frame and added new columns to check these conditions. Um, and then using the group by and summarize um, functions um, in the tidyverse package, I calculated the joint probabilities and saved them for the final table, which I'll show in a bit. Um, but before doing so, I need to take a step back and examine the marginal probabilities of A and B here as well. And intuitively, we can think through these without calculation, since the probability that X will be greater than the median of X um, is 0 0.50, because given that the median is the middle number in the distribution, half of the values will lie above and half will lie below the value, uh, making the probability of selecting <coughs> um, a value of X above or below this value would be 0 0.50. And then similarly for the probability that y will be less than the first quartile um, is 0 0.25, given that the first quartile is a value that denotes the range from the minimum value to the first quarter of the data uh, when sorted in order. Therefore, if randomly selecting y, you'll get a value below this first quartile about 25% of the time, and above it about 75% of the time. And then we can kind of check this assumption by um, doing these calculations in R and putting them into our table that we're going to output in a second. And from the, um, and then basically at that point, I think, you know, we were able to find the joint and um, conditional probabilities. And from the output of the table here, you can see that that intersection here between these two probabilities is 0 0.3756, uh, uh, which then matches with our part B answer from above here, um, which we got 0 0.3756 um, as well. So then in conclusion, um, really after generating the table above, we can say that the probability um, that X is greater than the median of the distribution of X and, and Y is greater than the first quartile um, the distribution of y does equal uh, these probabilities multiplied together um, since they both have the value of 0 0.3756. Okay, and then in the last part of problem one, it asks for us to check to see if independence holds by using the Fisher's exact test and the chi-square test. And before running these tests, I first had to create a frequency table that would that would take all this and kind of um, you know store this information for us to be able to use um, for our um, for our analysis here. And um, as you can see, uh, I basically wanted to split up the data based on our conditions that we have for our probabilities, right? So is, is X greater than um, the median of the distribution of X or is X less than um, or equal to the, the median of the distribution of X? And similarly, you know, we're doing the same thing for the quartile, um, first quartile of Y. And you can see that, as expected, we get the 50-50 split um, for the distribution of X, and then we get the 75-25 distribution, um, or split for the distribution for Y. Um, so to run the Fisher's exact test, I use the Fisher's.test function in R, um, and then to run the chi-square test, I use uh, the chi-square test.test .test, um, function in R here. Um, as we can see from the, from the outputs, um, we can reject the null hypothesis and accept the alternative hypothesis. This means that the independence does not hold and that there is a relationship between X and Y. And uh, thinking through this, that given that our sample has 10,000 observations, it would be more appropriate to rely on the chi-square test um, since Fisher's exact test is typically used for smaller sample sizes and provides more exact calculations on smaller numbers. Um, it wouldn't really perform well in this situation where we have such a large sample. All right, so then moving on to problem two here. Um, we were asked to register for the house prices um, advanced regression techniques competition on Kaggle, which I did um, using the um, username ZD Alexander, which I linked to at the bottom of the RPUBS file. Um, and then our, our first test was to provide some univariate descriptive statistics and appropriate plots of the training data set. After reading um, in the training data set, uh, from Kaggle and then my GitHub account. Um, I then was able to kind of um, put all of this data from the data frame, this training data, into the summary function in R, 
um, which I decided to comment out for now because the output was very long. Um, but basically the, the summary um, here would uh, kind of give me good next steps and to look at some of these numeric values specifically. Um, and then given that there are a large amount of numerical and quantitative values in the data, so I thought it would be valuable to separate these out um, from the categorical value uh, values in the data set to kind of show some visuals specifically for those quantitative variables first. Um, and so this is just a lot of syntax here separating out um, and tidying the, sum the summary statistics that I got earlier um, into a data frame just for the quantitative variables. And then this is the table output where we you're seeing them in the first quartile median mean, third quartile maximum, and um, the number of NAs for all of the quantitative variables here in this data frame. Um, and you can see here, this is more of the splitting going on. And then there's, here's the outputs that I did in the, this pairs function, which is a good, um, kind of like a correlation matrix here, where and it also has a histogram visual along the diagonal, which I thought was really handy to kind of be able to look at some of these distributions and how they could be utilized for um, the regression model that I'm gonna build later on. Um, you can see all this here, um, use all this for analysis. And then at the bottom here, um, really after exploring these variables a bit and looking at, this, at these uh, correlation matrices um, and the histograms that were attached to those, um, I, I think a couple of things kind of stood out to me. One was that you know, many living spaces uh, or many of the living spaces and the variables that were associated with those and the square footage values seem to have really strong correlations with one another, um, which makes sense because, you know, the square footage of one floor will likely be similar to the square footage of another floor in the house, typically. Um, and, you know, for instance, there's a strong correlation between the first floor square footage and the basement uh, square footage. And when I was thinking about the regression later, I think it's nice to have multiple options here just in case we need to throw in some proxy values or things like that to kind of um, substitute in one variable for another um, if one isn't performing super well. And then additionally, I, I was seeing a gradual but positive trend um, towards larger areas of uh, garages um, that were built uh, for, for houses that were built later in the 20th century, um, which I thought was interesting. So um, I, it'd be interesting to see if that actually tracks with um, an increase or uptick in sale price, whether or not they have larger garages uh, for, for houses that sell for more money. Um, I expect they do, but uh, might be interesting to look at further. Um, it's also interesting to see that, um, too, that the year of the house is built, that there's a relationship in the rating of the overall material and finished quality of the house. Um, again, it makes sense. I bet older houses, probably the quality and material um, might be um, deteriorating a little bit as you get older in age. So, But it was interesting to see that visually. Um, next, I... You know, I, I also thought that there'd be a fair amount of good value in the categorical variables. Um, and so I decided to make a few tables, uh, just quick um, looks at frequency counts of these. Um, and, you know, some quick assumptions here, quick quick things that, I, that kind of stood out. And it looks like the majority of the houses that are built on gentle slopes, um, or that most of them are built on gentle slopes here. Um, or there's a proportion that are built on uh, moderate or severe slopes, which some, could be something that might slice the data a bit when we're looking at the regression model um, later on. And then uh, similarly for foundation material, um, seems to be kind of a heavy split between cinder blocks and poured concrete, uh, which could be a good feature to use um, for the regression. And um, especially if there's like a connection between the year the house was built and which foundation type was used. So something to think through a little bit more. And finally, like the sale type and the sale condition were interesting values um, because it doesn't seem like there's a one size fits all um, option here. There's a pretty big spread, although there's there's some that are kind of pulled out a little bit more than others. But um, I thought they were pretty interesting. So those are some of my assumptions there. Um, then it asks us to create a scatter plot matrix for at least two of the independent variables um, and the dependent variables. Since we know that the dependent variable is sale price, we'll um, be sure to include this in our scatter plot matrix. Um, additionally, I also picked the independent variables for the square footage of um, the first floor, the above ground living area, square footage, the size of the garage, and the total basement square footage, and the year that the house was built. And you can see all these here. 
Um, interestingly, um, we can kind of see that the sale price seems to have some form of association with all these variables, as you can see from this last row here. Um, they tend to take a, on a mostly a positive linear form, indicating that there may be a relationship between the sale price and how big the square footage is, which again makes sense, um, but interesting to see in the plots here. Um, next, we were asked to derive a correlation matrix for any three of the quantitative variables in the training data set. For this, I chose the square footage of the first floor, um, the above ground living area, and the sale price. Um, so you can see those here. Um, and as you, as you can see, there's a pretty strong correlation, correlation between all these variables, and they um, take on a pretty linear shape when plotted out um, in their distributions there, or in their, in their scatter plots there. Um, and all of them have correlations above 0 0.55, um, which tend to fit the line pretty well. And then I've also printed out the visual below in the, in the correlation matrix. Um, it then asks us to do some hypothesis testing on the correlation um, between each pairwise set of variables and to see whether or not they seemingly, um, these seemingly strong correlations are just due to chance. Um, and after running the core test function R with a confidence level of um, 0 0.8 and the Pearson's method, we can see that the p-value for all three of these are less than 0 0.05 and even less than 0 0.001. Um, we can also see that the 80% confidence interval here for these outputs um, suggests that um, that the calculation between this, these bounds here, um, m all of them are much greater than zero, which is a good sign. It suggests that the correlations between these variables are not zero and that there's uh, some significant uh, relationship going on. Additionally, it, it um, asks here um, if we're worried about family-wise error for these correlations. Um, and from looking at my outputs, I, I, I think that we don't really have to worry much at all about family-wise error um, at this point um, because when we're dealing with a large sample size, um, over a thousand observations, and the p-values um, are, are less than 0 0.05, much less than um, that, and, and also like less than 0 0.001. Um, so it, there's um, a very small chance that we'd we, be we running into the trap of a type 1 error here. Okay, uh, moving on to the linear algebra section, uh, it asks us to invert the correlation matrix and, um, and uh, that we generated above here, um, which was right up, up here. Um, so I remember from class that um, in order to invert the, the matrix, um, you know, we can do this by hand or we can use one of these R functions and, what, and the, the handy R function that we can use here is the solve function. Um, and you can see the output is is here as well. Uh, and I saved it in a variable called the precision matrix since this is what it's often referred to. Um, and I remembered earlier from the course that when we multiply the inverse of the matrix uh, with the original matrix, we should get the identity matrix, uh, which is kind of alluding to this, equa this equation up here. And also we can see here that the correlation matrix time the, times the precision matrix should give us this identity matrix. Um, and when we go about doing that, that does actually indeed happen when we do these multiplications, right, of the precision, precision matrix and the correlation matrix and vice versa. You can see that we get a nice solid identity matrix, uh, which was to be expected. Um, finally, uh, we were asked to perform LU decomposition um, on the correlation matrix. And in the first few homework assignments, we created functions that calculate the upper triangle and lower triangle matrices. Um, however, I found a function R called the LU decomposition um, function, which uh, really saves a lot of time and uh, code space for doing this. Um, so I save these the the lower triangular triangular matrix um, in a variable L and the upper triangle matrix in a uh, variable uh, U. Um, and then obviously the original matrix is, is A here. Um, and you can see those, those here. And then uh, again, kind of given our, our equation for LU decomposition, um, it goes based on the fact that if you multiply uh, the lower triangle matrix times the upper triangle matrix, you should get the original matrix. And we can see here in R coding that that actually does occur. And then I just wrote this out as um, a formula um, in the R markdown file as well. 
All right, so then onto the calculus section of um, the final here. Um, it asks us to fit a closed form distribution to the data. Um, and from the tra training data set, I chose the above ground living area um, uh, for this part of the final. Um, and when we initially plot the distribution, we can see that it is right skewed, uh, which was which was intended and asked for in the um, instructions and fits the criteria for, for trying to fit an exponential distribution to it. Um, after checking and seeing that the minimum value is absolutely above zero, which it definitely is the case here, um, I didn't have to alter it at all or anything. Um, I loaded the mass package and then ran the fit dist um, function in R as the directions asked. Um, and you can see here, right, here's a summary of that variable, then loading the mass function or the mass package running the fit dist um, package. Um, we can see here that we get this output and I think remembering back from previous homework assignments the exponential cumulative distribution function requires a lambda value um, which we found here as the rate output um, and that's that's the value here it's this very small number um, and then using this lambda I generated a, a thousand sample variable um, distribution here which we can see using the, the lambda value and, and putting in um, thousand samples into this rxp um, function. And then really a few kind of takeaways when kind of comparing these two distributions, as you can see here. Um, the original data for um, the above ground living area or, or gr live area, uh, which is the variable name, appears to be shaped as a more normal distribution, which you can see. Here, um, albeit it's right skew, the most frequent uh, square footage tends to be around um, 1500 square feet um, and 1650 square feet so right in that this range here um, and then alternatively the exponential distribution um, here that we created uh, appears to be even more of a right skewed um, uh, distribution it takes on uh, more of an exponential shape and with a longer tail which was to be expected all right um, now as as review from from uh, the past weeks. Uh, the, the next task is to find the 5th and 95th percentiles using the exponential cumulative distribution function. Uh, since we already have found lambda, this is pretty straightforward. I substituted in lambda into our equation below, uh, which I've laid out here, um, and setting the equation equal to 0 0.05 and then, then to 0 0.95 to find the 5th and 95th percentiles respectively. We, we can see that uh, we got the, the 5th percentile of about um, 77.73 square feet, and then the 95th percentile of 4,539-ish square feet. Um, and I also did a quick check on these calculations by using um, an, an R function QX, um, and they match up, as you can see here. So I'm pretty confident in those outputs at that point. Um, so then the, the next section uh, will generate the 95th confidence interval for the empirical value. Um, or the empirical variable of the above ground living area um, using the equation here, um, which is the mean, um, sorry, it's, it's, uh, it's the mean plus or minus the z-score times the standard deviation divided by um, the square root of, of n. Um, and as mentioned, this is assuming normality, and the equation reflects this. Because and because of this, we can use 1.96, uh, which is kind of the standard value of z, of z um, for calculating a 95% confidence interval. Um, we also have the mean, the standard deviation, and the sample size available to us already. So therefore, I was able to calculate the upper and lower bounds of the confidence interval. And then, you know, just out of curiosity, also, I also calculated the median and mean values for this empirical value as well. Um, after this, it asks us to calculate the 5th and 95th percentile of the data, which I then put into a table along with the exponential probability function percentiles to show the comparison. Um, I found that my calculations for the exponential um, cumulative distribution function percentiles in the, in the empirical percentiles um, are summarized pretty well in the table above. Um, and I found that when calculating the 90, 95th uh, percent uh, Ninety-five percent confidence interval from the empirical data. I found that the, that the interval um, being um, from one thousand four hundred eighty-eight, roughly to one thousand five hundred forty-two, um, 
and and the median of this to be 1,515, um, and one thousand and the median being 1,464 respectively. Um, I think that we can see here that there's a strong um, discrepancy between this exponential distribution function um, outputs and what we would find with the empirical percentiles. And on top of that too, we can't really fit this to a uh, normal di distribution really well. Um, the, the fit just doesn't seem to match up really well. And, and um, at the percentile the, the percentiles mean that 95% of the houses in our training data set have above ground living areas that fall below these markers. Um, and therefore that the exponential percentile um, suggests that 95% of the houses have above ground living areas that are less than or equal to 4,539 square feet. Um, while this is like very far off from the empirical data, that tells us that 95% of the houses have about um, have above ground living areas of up to 2,466 square feet. Um, so because of this large distance, uh, difference between these two values and kind of looking at the fit being not extremely good, um, even visually, we can see here, um, I said this isn't really the good, uh, that an exponential distribution wouldn't be a really good fit for um, the estimator of this empirical value of um, above ground living area. Okay. All right. So then, moving on to the final portion of the final, it asks for us to build um, some type of multiple regression um, model and to submit it to the competition board. Uh, I decided I'd, I'd build a straightforward linear regression model for this exercise. But before diving in, I, I kind of took a look back at my correlation matrices and scatter plots and noticed some interesting interactions between the variables I had listed here, uh, many of which showed strong correlations with one another and seemed to be logically good predictors of um, housing and sale price. Um, additionally, I saw a few variables from the categorical data set I created that also seemed like they would be good candidates for this. And I had kind of listed them here. Um, and before running these models, I made sure to kind of recode some of my categorical variables to cut down on the output and to see if I could group categories together where it seemed fit. I also um, checked for null values before processing. So this is me recoding the, the categorical variables. Also checking for nulls. Looks like I don't have any at this point in time. All right, so finally, um, I built a, a kind of a smaller training data set of just my variables of interest to cut down on the, um, on the complexity, uh, which I think I accidentally skipped over here. It's right here. Um, and then obviously again checking to make sure there's no null values and these and this training data set just has the variables that I thought were interesting and would want to use in the multiple regression model. Um, I'd, I tweak this later on but um, for now it's kind of where we're at. All right um, and then after running my first output um, with these variables that I've listed here um, it seems to be not bad. Uh, the R square value is 0 0.734, uh, but I think I can do better by trimming some of the variables that seem to have high p-values in the output here. And you can see these that, you know, based on the significance testing here, um, have pretty high p-values um, for those. And so I use backward elimination and the step function R to give it another go, um, which you can see that I did here. Um, and it, again, it cut down on some of these variables that had high p-values so that removed them from the model. Um, but you can see that the adjusted R-squared value didn't change much at all. Um, so it didn't have much of an effect. So at this point, I decided to kind of go back to the drawing board a bit and add in a few more, a few additional variables, including the neighborhood, the square footage of um, the porch, the above ground area of the kitchen, the quality of the exterior part of the house, the material of the roof, the year a remodel happened on the house and the overall quality of the house, which I've listed here. Um, and then I also removed a few variables, including uh, whether or not there was central air, the slope of the land on which the house sits, the year the house was built in the area of the garage and the total number of, of above ground rooms, all of which seemed to have not super high p-values and didn't seem to be, um, when I removed them from the model, didn't seem to be really um, drastic changes in our square value there. Um, all right, so when rerunning, rerunning the model with this edited group um, of attributes, it performed much better. My R-square value jumped to 0 0.86. Um, however, given that there were some new 
categorical values in this model, the output um, utilize each factor in the regression. So you can see here that neighborhood specifically had a lot of variables listed, which would create a pretty long model. Now I want to make sure that when we use this model in the testing data set that it would still perform well and that this R square value on the training data set wasn't due to overfitting um, and would perform pretty poorly when, it, when we put on the testing data set. So therefore I decided to recode the um, neighborhood variable specifically. Um, and you know, I did this based on systematically looking at those neighborhoods that had uh, very low p-values and kind of coding all of the rest and grouping those that had higher p-values together and then um, kind of being able to split based on the ones that showed lower p-values there. And you can see the coding there. I re-ran the model. Um, and I came up with a very similar R square value, which was good, and it was much cleaner output here uh, with, a low, with a smaller set of variables. Uh, my R square value came out to be about 0, um, 0.85 at this point in time. Um, and it's from this, I think this is a pretty good, um, good place to kind of think about submitting. Um, but before I did that, I just wanted to explain too that this R square value um, was 0.85 really kind of um, states that about 85% of the variability of the sale price um, can be um, accounted for from these variables that are listed in this model, which is which is pretty good. Um, and then really before submitting and running my test data to kind of see how this performs, I wanted to make sure that this, this uh, model is valid, that we can kind of move forward with this. Um, and so I did some tests on the residuals, and I found that the median residual value was roughly around zero. Um, it, was a, it was a negative 554, but when you think about the magnitude and the and the scale of this data set, uh, that's pretty close to zero um, you know, when you put it into perspective. Um, and that the maximum and minimum values of the residuals were pretty balanced. Um, you can see here it's a little bit skewed, but uh, not, not too bad um, in terms of the magnitude and degree of the minimum maximums there. Um, again, mentioning the R-square value. And uh, then I also um, plotted out the residual values um, against the fitted values, and I saw that they were pretty uniformly scattered around zero, which is a good sign. Um, we had a couple outliers um, up in the top right corner, um, which I was a little worried about, but I think for the most part it was hovering around. Um, everything was uniformly scattered around zero as best as it could. And then you can see when plotting these in the QQ norm, um, or QQ plots and using the QQ norm function, you can see that it is um, pretty normally distributed except for some of these on the poles. Um, and uh, when I do the histogram, it's slightly left skewed, but for the most part, um, it is approaching normal, uh, which is a good sign. So overall, from these residual tests, it seemed that this is a pretty valid um, model that we could use uh, for our testing data. So then, finally, I imported the testing data set that I had downloaded from Kaggle and um, I put in my GitHub repository and I ran my final model on this training data set. Um, and as you can see from the distributions of the test data and the training data, it was, a nice, it was nice to see that the shapes were pretty similar here. Um, so you can see here on the left-hand side, this is the test data distribution. And on the right-hand side, here's the training uh, data with the sale price there. And this is the predicted sale price from the test data on the left, um, which you can see is, is pretty, pretty much a good match, um, which made me feel pretty confident about submitting. So I, I um, basically... Uh, took this and then I finalized the output and then reshape it into the format needed to submit the Kaggle. I uploaded my file um, and I received a score of 0 0.42, which is not bad. It kind of put me in the middle of the pack of the competition. Um, you know, I'm hoping, I think, at some point in the future to kind of take this a step further and, and run a um, additional analysis and, and model, uh, maybe with the support vector machines, SVM model, or a random forest model to see if it yields better results. Um, but at this point, uh, you can see that my username for Kaggle is here, ZD Alexander. Here's my score. Um, and after I stop recording this video, I'll put the link in the R post file so you can, you can see the link uh, there. Um, Thanks.